Okay, I think that we're currently live now. So this is the uh, lecture for um, 641. It's the second lecture on the EM algorithm. And uh, we're going to cover now the material on the, um, uh, the, the theory. So last time we talked about sort of the intuition that, that uh, the simplest application of the EM algorithm is the separation of clusters. When, when you have, say, Gaussian clusters, for example, they don't have to be Gaussian, but when you have Gaussian clusters and they overlap, and you want to separate them, estimate parameters of the clusters. You want to find the means and the variances of the clusters, but they overlap, so that makes it uh, difficult. And, um, and uh, the dis underlying distribution, so you have complete and incomplete data. X is the unobserved data. So um, th the joint distribution, when you have, um, when you have these kinds of Gaussians, uh, it's called a Gaussian mixture because for each component of the Gaussian, uh, it, it, for each component, its distribution is Gaussian, but now you have the sum of Gaussian distributions. So the sum of Gaussian random variables are Gaussian, but the sum of Gaussian distributions is not Gaussian. Um, to see that, so, so if you add two random variables, you can involve the distribution. So if you convolve two Gaussian distributions, you get a Gaussian distribution. But if you add the two distributions, you don't get something that's Gaussian. So if x, so let's say x here is, um, this is, uh, hold on for a second, where's my pen? Uh, oh, here it is. x is, um, uh, is, is normal with mean zero, or so it was mean mu one and variance sigma squared, sigma squared, one squared, and uh, so this is, and, and y, say, is normal with mean mu two and variance sigma two squared. Well, if I add x plus y to form z, the, the, and if they're independent, then the distribution of z is going to be normal with mean mu one plus mu two and variance sigma one squared plus sigma two squared. You can prove that relatively easily by just taking the convolution of the two density functions. And this is essentially the essence of the central limit theorem. But when you add the density, density functions, you have one density function like that and another density function like that. When you add them, you get something like this. Clearly that's not Gaussian, right? Oops, clearly that is not Gaussian, right? Because the Gaussian can't be bimodal like that. So, um, so, uh, so, so the combination of all those Gaussians is going to be a jointly Gaussian, is going to be, a, I'm sorry, a Gaussian mixture. And this is the form of a Gaussian mixture. Um, and then, the, the trick is then to take observations of the Gaussian mixture and estimate the underlying parameters of the, of the distribution from the Gaussian mixture observations. But remember, the parameters of the distribution are the means and, co and variances of the individual Gaussians, and then the um, parameters of that binary variable. The binary var variable is going to be uh, take on a value between 0 and n minus 1, depending upon um, what class that sample is drawn from. And this picture over here illustrates graphically the situation. So for each um, class, you generate Gaussian random variables with an appropriate mean and, and, vari and variance, or standard deviation. And then you select from these uh, to produce the observation. Um, OK, so now. Um, uh, and then here I just, just to review, I pointed out that if you actually observe both the labels and the, the observations y, then you could estimate uh, the mean for each class and the variance for each class pretty simply. But if you're missing x, what are you supposed to do? So, um, 
So uh, that's what we want to cover today. Um, so there's kind of a neat theoretical uh, framework for this that works out quite nicely. And to do it, hold on for a second. To do it, uh, um, uh, you should read this section here. I'm going to basically go through this section on the theoretical foundation of the EM algorithm, OK? Um, uh, so I'm going to do the derivations of this, but, I, but you can go through this in detail, OK? So um, um, uh, right. So the way it works is like this. Um, well, first of all, uh, so you have, so you, first of all, you're going to have to just kind of go along with my derivation here because it's going to seem like unmotivated. But just, just go along with the steps and uh, when we get to the end, I'll apply some intuition, okay? So I'm going to decompose, um, I'm going to decompose the log likelihood into two components. The first computer component I'm going to call the Q function, okay? And the second, uh, there's this H function. And theta here is, uh, can take on any value. Theta prime can take on any value. So theta is, this theta is the same as that theta, but theta prime can take on any value. You say, well, what are you talking about? Just don't worry about it. <laughs> Just accept it for the time being. Okay, it's a formal relationship. And um, theta prime can be any value of a parameter. So both theta and, and theta prime live in the same space. So theta is a member of some set of parameters omega. And theta prime is also a member of the same, of the same space. But they're just two different values of the parameters, OK? The, and, and theta prime here can take on any value, OK? So um, uh, let's see. So um, the first thing I need to do is this. Uh, hold on. Just a minute. Yeah. Um, so uh, blah, 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 blah. OK, so. Uh, So, yeah, hold on. I need to first show that, um, where it is, okay. So let me just kind of go through it here. So the Q function is defined as the expected value, of, uh, okay, this is, the, this is the, the Q function and this is the H function. So if I, um, okay, if I, if I take, um, so if I take these two definitions, so if you look at equation 8.5 and 8.6, right, um, then if I sum Q and H, then taking the expectation is linear, right, uh, and um, addition of the two logs is equivalent to multiplication, right? So if I take um, Q of theta, theta prime, and I add to it h of theta, theta prime, well, that'll be equal to um, the expected value of the log of p of y comma, this is an uppercase x. I'll emphasize why that's an uppercase in just a moment divided by P of uppercase X given Y and theta, given Y equals little y and theta prime. So where did this expression come from? Because I'm just using these two definitions. I know these seem like crazy definitions. They're completely pulled out of the hat. But just believe me, okay? So the expression pulled out of a hat, it comes from the fact that um, you know, like when you had a magician, right? Uh, one of the favorite things they used to, the magician would hear, wear a top hat, okay? And then you'd have, and then what they would do is, a favorite magic trick is that they'd reach into the top hat and they'd pull out, you know what they'd pull out? 
A rabbit. Okay, good. So you, they pull out a rabbit. So that looks kind of like a rabbit, I think. We're kind of getting near Easter anyway. No, not really. But anyway, so, okay, so I have these two expressions. If I add them together, then when I subtract the expectation, I can take the expectation out of the two logs, and then the difference between the two logs is the ratio of the two expressions. So I'm going to get, uh, what? I'm going to get this, okay? So now I look at this ratio here. Now x is a random variable, and little y is just a number. Um, uh, and, and by the way, I'm just assuming this, okay? So all I'm doing, I just wrote these crazy things down. I said q is this and h is this, and I subtracted them where x here is a random variable and I'm conditioning on the value of y. So uh, when I look at this ratio, I look at this ratio, my question is, well, what is this? So this is the probability of y given x over theta divided by the probability of, um, of x given y in theta, okay? But this thing is, um, uh, okay, so, hold on for a second. So why, all right, oh, so, oh, okay, I need to work backwards just a little here. You know that the probability of x given y and theta times the probability of y given theta, that's the probability of x and y given theta, right? You believe that? So this has got to be true. This is basically just the definition of conditional expectation. But if I take uh, this term, right? Oh, no. If I take this term and I divide it by here, then I get this. So this thing here has to equal the probability of y given theta. Let me go through that again. You know that the probability of x given y and theta times the probability of y given theta has got to equal to the joint probability of x times y given theta. So you believe this, I assume, right? Because that's just the conditional probability density. So if I just take this term here and divide both sides by it, I get this equation up here, right? Okay, that means that this ratio here, which is exactly that ratio, by the way, is just the probability of y given theta. So this whole thing here is, um, that's equal to the expected value of the log of the probability of y given theta. Right? So is the logic of that clear? Let me go through that a little more. Let me review that. I know this is a little bit crazy, but it's true, okay? So the, the log likelihood of y given theta is the q function plus the h function. Oh, no. Okay. I don't know this. I'm going to prove this. Okay. Okay. I'm just defining the q function and the h function as equations 8.5 and 8.6. So this is the definition of h and the q and h, and I'm going to show that 8.4 folds. So if I just plug in the definitions for the q and the h functions, I get this expectation here, right? Where I have this ratio between these two probabilities. But the ratio of these two probabilities is just the conditional probability of y given theta. And that's true because I know that this is true. See, this is true, so that implies that. And this implies this, right? And, okay, so those are all true. So therefore, the sum of the h and the q functions 
has to be, let me zoom out a little bit. The sum of the h and the q function has to be equal to this expectation of the log of p of y given theta over y and theta prime. Now, there's a little interesting detail, which is that the conditional probability of y given theta, this is not a random variable. Okay? This, there's nothing random in here. Y, that's a lowercase y. This was an uppercase x up here, but I got rid of the x. The ratio between these two things is not a function of x. It's the conditional probability of y given x, or theta. So this whole thing here is just the log of p of y given theta. So I've just proved the result. I proved that the sum of q and h so the sum of q and h, right, is the expectation of the log of the ratio of these two probabilities. That came because I used the definition of q and h, and I just plugged into the definition, and I took the, the difference of the logs, and that was the ratio of the probabilities. So now this ratio of these probabilities is the conditional probability of y given theta, and uh, okay, so if I plug in the conditional probability of y given theta, now I have the expectation of something that's not random, so I don't even care about the expectation. It's just equal to this. So uh, I've now proved the basic point. The basic point is equation 8.4, which is that the log of the probability of y given theta is the sum of the q and the h function. And you'd say, so what? That's the most bizarre relationship. Who cares? Okay? Well. It's going to come in really handy in just a moment, okay? So the, the, the uh, probability of y given theta is the sum of the q and the h function. You see, that's what this, this relationship is here. You can go through this carefully, right? So I've said here that, first of all, uh, this, uh, here I'm going in the other direction. The log of probability is the log of the sum of these ratios of these probabilities. I know that from this equation here, right? And um, then I just break that into these two sums, and that's the q function and the h function. So this is a very important relationship, that the log, the log likelihood is the sum of q plus h. Now the second info, that's the first insight. That's the first uh, thing we learn. Then the second insight is this, that h always has its minimum at h prime. Okay. So uh, first I'm going to explain what equation 8.7 means, and then I'm going to prove it. Because the proof of 8.7 is kind of formal, I mean, you go through each step, it's kind of interesting, but it doesn't give you a huge amount of insight, at least not for me. Um, so what does this mean? Um, well, you have H. Okay, so, so what does this mean? Okay, um, so if we have here H of theta semicolon theta prime, and we plot it, and say that point there is theta prime, right? So if we plot it, it says that it's going to be minimum. It takes on its minimum. It has on some. It has some value, right? At h of theta prime, theta prime. I mean, it has to take on some value, whatever that is, right? And at that value, that's a lower bound for every other point. So it's got to be like this. So this is the function h of theta, semicolon theta prime, for fixed value of theta prime. So h takes on its minimum at that point. Now, um, q, so the log likelihood is, um, right, so um, q, of theta, theta prime, is equal to the log likelihood 
minus h of theta of theta prime, right? So, so what this says, what does this say? It says that this q function, um, this q function, um, when, okay, what this really says is that q here is a subfunctional or substitute functional or surrogate function for this log likelihood. Because if I, um, if I add to, uh, hold on, um, if I add to theta, theta prime, plus h of theta prime, theta prime, this is going to be equal to log of p of y given theta minus h of theta, theta prime minus h of theta prime, theta prime. Okay, that's probably as clear as mud, but the bottom line is this thing here, this thing here is always greater than zero. And this is the log likelihood. So this entire expression here, we could call this expression, entire expression the little q of theta, theta prime. This entire uh, expression here is always equal to the log likelihood minus something positive. So what does that mean? If it's always equal to something, uh, it's log likelihood minus something positive, that means that um, this Q is a lower bound for that log likelihood. So for the maximization problem associated with maximizing the log likelihood, this is a substitute functional for that. Okay? Let me draw, let me show you the picture. Excuse me? Right. Oh my gosh, you got it. By gosh, you got it. Did you, did you see what's going on here? So what's happening is for maximization, you're, we're trying to do maximization with maximum likelihood, right? So you have a function like this, and, the, and we're at some particular point here, theta prime. This thing is this q function, it's a lower bound. So you can maximize this lower bound and be guaranteed to have increased the log likelihood. It's just the same game we were playing with the surrogate functions or substitute functions with the, uh, the majorization minimization of the previous chapter. That's actually why I had that first. So that way you get introduced to the concept before you see the EM algorithm. Now, most people who use the EM algorithm don't understand any of this, okay? But this is really a critical piece of understanding why the EM algorithm works. Now, now, so the key, there's really two key ideas. One is that H takes on its minimum value when theta is equal to theta prime. And the other key idea is that you can decompose the log likelihood as a sum of Q and H. The combination of those two things is what allows you to um, uh, uh, use the M algorithm to, to minimize the log, uh, to maximize the log of likelihood. Okay. So now the proof that this is true is based on Jensen inequality. Um, I'll just, I guess, go through it step by step so you can see the justification. Do you have a question? Yeah, this, this is the beauty. Actually, these proofs... Right. I'm sorry. How, oh, how do I find... Well, I haven't told you how to minimize anything, okay? I haven't said how I'm going to minimize or maximize this function with respect to theta, okay? But, you know, that could be just as hard as maximizing... So, the where we're going to go with this Okay, is, um, 
where we're going to go with this is that the basic update, I'm jumping ahead, is that you take the E step is you, you first compute the Q function, right? This is, I'm giving you the end result. The M algorithm is going to turn out to be a two-step process. First, you compute the, e, the Q function, which is this crazy expression, the conditional expectation. We'll assign some meaning to that intuitively in a moment. And the second thing then is you maximize the first argument for the fixed value of the second. And then you update it and you repeat. So E means, they call this the E step because you compute an expectation. You call this the M step because you maximize. Now, this maximization might be hard to do or it might be easy to do. In a lot of problems, it's easy to do and that's why you've constructed it this way. But the E step, and the E step might be hard or easy to do. But regardless, it's always the case that this will, repeated application of this will increase the log likelihood because the Q function is going to be uh, a surrogate function for the log likelihood. It's a lower bounding function to the, to, to the log likelihood, modulo a constant. Okay, so let me, um, let me um, explain this in a little more detail. Um, okay, so, net, so you see that the two steps are, one is that you can decompose the log likelihood as the sum of these two terms, and the second is that the H font has its minimum at theta equals theta prime. So the proof of, of 8.7 is, is here. So, okay, so this is the proof. It's not particularly, the proof isn't real intuitive. When you get to the end, you get the right result, but the steps seem a little bit unmotivated. You first of say saying by the log of this integral is zero. Why? Because that integral is one. That's a probability density function, so its integral has to be one. The log of one is zero. So that's true, right? Now, um, the, uh, this is true as long as that these terms I'm dividing by are not zero because I'm just dividing and multiplying by the same number. Okay, now, um, now here's the key step. This is a density function, so this expression here, um, uh, you can, um, if you have, okay, Jensen is an inequality we've run into before, says that if you take, um, if you have um, some, if you have some function, right, and if the function is, this is concave, uh, concave, right? So if you take the expected, and you have some random variable here, x, right? And you compute the expected value of f of x, right, versus the function of the expected value of x. So in one case, so you'd have some sort of distribution. So over here, uh, so you'd have, that would be like the expected value of x, and that would give you some point, and you'd have some value. But if you have, if the distribution is y, then it kind of is going to be over this whole function, and in that case, the, va the average value is going to be here, okay? So the expected value of the function is always going to be greater than or equal to the function of the expected value if f is convex, right? That's Jensen's inequality. Jensen's inequality, which is the basis for information theory, really, okay? Now, uh, if you look at this, this is like the x, you're taking the log of, this is an expectation of that quantity in there. So the log of the expectation has got to be greater than the, uh, the, oh, okay, so the log is, is um, the log is concave, right? So here the expected value of f of x has got to be less than or equal to f of the expected value of x, right? So uh, here the log is um, con concave, right? So uh, then this will be less than, oh, I'm getting greater than, let me see, the expected value, oh, right. 
So this would be greater, yeah. So this would be greater than the, in, the expected value of the log. Believe me, it's correct. So uh, now, once you have the expected value log, now you take that log and you can separate it out into two parts. And now this is just then, if you just look at the definition, it's just H, uh, it's just H prime of H prime, and this is H of theta, I mean, I'm sorry, it's H of theta prime at theta prime, and the first term is minus H of theta theta prime. So you've shown that this thing here is less than or equal to zero, is effectively what you've shown, and based upon that, then the, 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 uh, re uh, the results immediate. Because what we're trying to show is that h, the h of theta theta prime is greater than or equal to h of theta prime theta prime. So we have it right there. Right? You just add, uh, this implies that um, h of theta theta prime is greater than or equal to h of theta prime theta. But be that as it may, I think the only thing you really need to take away from this is that you can use uh, Jensen's inequality to show this important result. Yeah. What is the meaning of theta prime? That's a very good point. Um, what the meaning of theta prime is, is that if theta prime is our current value of a parameter, we can improve the estimate of the parameter by calculating the Q function at theta prime and then maximizing with respect to theta. So theta prime is the point of local approximation. When we have this, when we're doing, we're doing maximum likely estimation, we have this curve, right? This is our current, theta prime is our current point, and then theta is the new value. So the reason we have two variables now instead of one is because theta prime is the point of approximation and theta is the actual value that we allow for the parameter. And now we're approximating the true log likelihood, but it's, a, it's a, an approximation which has guaranteed properties because it's a strict lower bound. And it's, tan it's equal to at that point. Now, it, you know, the equality depends upon proper shifting of this DC point of offset. In other words, um, you know, I had to add H of theta prime, theta prime. Th th that makes this all a little bit confusing. See, in other words, if I took this curve and I just shift it up or down, it doesn't really matter because when I do the maximization, I'm still going to get the same answer. Is that clear? Someone asked me a question. It would make me feel a lot better. Are you really understanding this or, or, or no? Because if you're not understanding it, just ask me any question, like a really simple question. I won't say dumb because there are none. But does it make sense? This is important. You need to actually sit down and think through this clearly, okay? So, um, uh, so this is... 61, 62, uh, okay, so let's see. So once we have that, now we know, okay, um, it's easy enough to show that the change in the log likelihood is lower bounded by the change in the Q function, see? So this is the change, I mean, it's easy enough to show this. Once you know that H is, has this property, you just subtract, uh, well, I mean, I'll let you work it out, okay? But you just subtract, uh, okay, is this here? Uh, isn't it quite simple? Okay, so, uh, so P of theta, theta, here it is. P of, of Y given theta is just equal to, okay, it's just equal to Q plus H, right? And P of Y given theta prime is equal to Q 
of theta prime minus theta h prime, right? So, if I, so, so the right and the left hand sides of those equations are equal. I rearrange some terms and now I get, well I get here I get h of theta theta prime minus h of theta prime theta prime. This thing has to be positive, right? This is greater than or equal to zero. So since that term has to be positive, that means that this q has to be a lower bound for this. Not only is it positive, but when theta equals theta prime, this difference is zero. So it's positive, so this function here has got to be uh, a substitute function for, for the log likelihood on the left. Because it's equal to the log likelihood when theta equals theta prime, but it's a lower bound everywhere else. And that's the key point of this picture, that it's equal at the current point and it's a lower bound everywhere else, right? Does this make sense? Okay. So what does that mean? It means that every time we update theta, we've increased the log likelihood, right? And that means that, that results in the celebrated EM algorithm. The E step is you first compute the expectation of the log likelihood with respect to uh, the, okay, so now let's go back and actually look a little more detailed how we define Q, okay? The way we define Q is that, um, that it's the conditional expectation of the joint probability of Y and X, but we, we condition with respect to the knowledge of Y. So let me think of, hold on to that thought a minute. So you compute Q, that's the, that's the E step, and then you compute M, that's the update. The update is like the maximum likelihood estimator. So what does this mean? This is really important, because I say that a lot. Well, there's a lot of really important things in this class, I think. Okay, maybe people wouldn't agree with me, but I, I, I feel that true. So, um, look, let's look at this Q function. Have you been reading the notes, by the way? Yeah, how many people have been reading the notes? Good. You've been agreeing with me a lot because you're following what I'm saying. Did you guys read the notes? Okay, good. Okay, so let's look at this expression here for the Q. What is it saying? You know, what you'd really like to have is you'd like to have the log of P of Y X given theta, right? You really, really would like to have that. Because then you could compute the maximum likelihood estimate. Then you would just say, you'd say the arg max over theta, and that would be theta hat, and you'd be done, right? But you can't do this. Why can't you do this? X is gone. There's no X. You don't have X. If you don't have X, you can't maximize this because you don't know what X is, right? So if you don't know what X is, remember last time you were saying, well, you want to kind of substitute something in for X, right? Well, what is this doing? It's saying, oh, well, what we'll do, since we don't max, no x, we'll take the expectation over x's value. For so I'm computing the conditional expectation of x. But it's a chicken and egg problem. Have you ever heard of a chicken and egg problem? Do you know what a chicken and egg problem is? Chicken and egg problem is like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, if you get an egg, it hatches into a chicken, right? But then the chicken produces an egg. So uh, what came first, okay? So this is a chicken and egg problem because I can't compute the distribution of x unless I know the parameter theta. But I can't estimate this parameter theta unless I know x. This is a classic chicken and egg problem, right? You don't know which one to do first. So what you do is you start at any theta. 
from that theta, you compute the expectation over x so you can get rid of it. Okay? And then once you've gotten rid of x, now you maximize over theta. You maximize over theta, that's the m step. You maximize over theta to estimate a new theta. Now you go back, reuse the new theta, and you recompute the expectation over x. See, the whole thing here is that you didn't have x. You needed x, but you didn't have it. This is another, this is sort of another corollary to the fundamental theorem, which is Mick Jagger's theorem. If you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you get what you need, okay? You didn't have what you wanted. What you wanted was x and y, but all you had was y. So you had to do something about x. So you took the value of theta you knew, and you could, took the expectation over x to get rid of it. Then you took the result, which was q, and you pretended that was like your log likelihood, and you took the, you maximized that over theta. And then once you maximize over theta, now you have a better estimate of theta, you keep repeating. Now, this isn't just a heuristic, this actually has a rigorous interpretation, which is that every step of this increases the value of the log likelihood. So as, the, as uh, for each um, step, the log likelihood has gone up, you'll eventually converge to a local minimum at least, maybe a global minimum of the, of the log likelihood function. Right? Um, so you can see the Q function is a substitute function for maximization of the log likelihood. And, and um, the minimum, oh, the minimum over theta of H is, is, is uh, theta prime, okay? So these are the key properties. So now you can see the EML state, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm supposed to have the game, the room until uh, 6.20, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we could, they've given, yeah, I, okay. Well, I guess we can leave a little early, but we, have, we actually have the room until 6.20. Because uh, we have it from 5.30, that's what they scheduled us for, right? I mean, I didn't want this room, but... This is what we got. Okay, I'll get out. And just, let me just wrap up. Okay, so um, do you, everybody, uh, so you understand that? So we've gone then through the, um, uh, eight point through. So read this over again, and then in the next section, we'll actually apply this to mixture distribution. So you see how this theory actually works in practice. Okay? All right. And I think we're being kicked out of here, even though we really have it. Okay? All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay.